But before we begin with today's message, would you join with me in a word of prayer? Father God, we know in this moment that our understanding of you and your word is finite. So Father, we desperately need your spirit to give light to meaning, to give light to understanding, and to hear from you. So Father, today we pray that you would block out all distractions so that we would see nothing but your son Jesus Christ and him lifted up so that you get the glory that you righteously deserve. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So I'm just going to do a quick little shameless plug. If you are not in a life group, which is also known as a small group, I'm going to tell you this, please join one. And so I'm going to give a shameless plug to one. There's a millennial group that is meeting this afternoon, immediately after the service in room 100. And so if you are a millennial, please go join them. Will and Liza lead it. There will be lunch. So if you're thinking about lunch right now, lunch is taken care of for you. And it's going to meet right here behind this wall. For everybody else that's already in a life group, if your life group meets Sunday morning, guess what? There's no life groups next Sunday because next Sunday is Easter. Easter. And we are going to invite people to church and Easter. Those are both the right answers. So whoever said church, you are most correct. So, uh, but yeah, so that's my little shameless plug. So um, as I... As we've been doing this series called Journey to the Cross, um, I hope you guys have been enjoying it. We've been enjoying walking through this journey of what Christ actually went through. And Pastor Brian did a beautiful job last week as he beautifully crafted the message, sharing with us Jesus' experience in the Garden of Gethsemane and looking at the struggle that he had, knowing what he was about to suffer. And he said, God, if this, any way this cup could pass, let it pass. But then he says these words, but not my will be done, but yours. And then he stood in confidence, ready to embrace the very next part of his journey. And so as I sat back to begin to study today's passage, there is a couple questions that I asked myself because this passage this morning brings us to Jesus' crucifixion. And so I had two questions that I wrestled with this past week. And it's the first one is this. Why the cross? And I know that's not grammatically correct, but I didn't care because it's my brain and that's how I asked the question. Why the cross? I mean, why did Jesus really have to die on a cross, right? The cross and crucifixions were brutal. They were horrific. They were grotesque. If you watched it, you would probably puke. And this is what Jesus went through. The Roman soldiers crucified thousands and thousands of people. They crucified so many that they had to get creative to give themselves an enjoyable time. They would try to crucify people in different positions with different techniques because they were bored of just crucifying people in one certain way. The goal of these crucifixions were to inflict as much pain and torture as possible while at the same time degrading and shaming the person that is hanging on this cross. And out of all the thousands of people who were crucified, one person stands out 2,000 years plus later that all of us still talk about today. Jesus Christ. Clearly, the cross was intentional. Clearly, this is the way that Jesus had to die. But when you look at today for all of us, we see crosses everywhere, right? You see them on purses, you see them on wallets, you see them on Bibles, you see them on cars, you see them on churches, you see them on advertisements. People wear them as necklaces and bracelets. The cross is everywhere. And for all of us as Christians, we understand and realize the cross is our hope. And so we remember that. But for the people living there during that time, this was not a word of hope for them. Those who lived the crucifixions, those who watched the crucifixions, those who heard the crucifixion, those who smelled the crucifixion, the cross was completely different. This was the Romans' way of declaring to everybody, we're in charge, you're not. If you step out of line, 
we will use our greatest weapon against you, death. For Roman citizens, it was not properly or have the right manners to even mention the word cross. It was that horrific. Yet Jesus died on a cross. And I asked myself, why the cross? Out of all the shameful, horrific, horrible ways to die, why couldn't God just choose another method? Why did he have to do the cross? So that's the first question that I wrestled with. The second is this. What did the cross actually accomplish? Was the death on the cross just a means to get to the resurrection? Was it God saying, okay, I need to kill the Messiah, so hmm, cross, dead, resurrection, yay? No, it wasn't just a means to get to the resurrection. There was something intentional, something purposeful, because 2,000 plus years later, we are meeting here today to talk about what happened on the cross. And so for me, as I began to research this, I, need, I, need, I knew I needed to go to one place, which was the Scriptures. Because the Bible says that Jesus died in accordance with what? The Scriptures. So to find these answers, I knew this is where I was going to go. And more specifically, in today's passage, we are in Mark chapter 15. So if you have your Bible, I will encourage you to turn to Mark chapter 15. And so we're going to unpack these two questions. Why the cross? And what did the cross actually accomplish? And as you're turning to Mark chapter 15, our verses that we're going to really dive into today are verses 33 through 39. And many times when we look at dealing with the cross and what's the purpose of the cross and what's the cross all about, a people, a lot of people immediately they jump to the Apostle Paul and say, let's figure out what the Apostle Paul said. Now, the Apostle Paul has a lot of things to say about the cross, a lot of good things. But remember, the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, their gospels are called the gospels because their gospels contain what? The gospel, okay? So we're going to find the gospel of the cross in one of the gospels. And we have to pay attention to Mark chapter 15 because there are details that Mark is pointing out where if we blow by them and we don't pay attention to them, we're going to miss it. We're going to miss the story. We're going to miss the gospel. And we're going to miss what Mark is doing in all of chapter 15. So Immediately, Pastor Brian left us with Jesus standing up in confidence, ready to embrace this next part of the journey. And immediately, Jesus is arrested because one of his disciples has betrayed him. And so he goes into custody of the Jewish leaders. And then we see right after that, Peter denies Jesus. Peter, the one that says, I will never deny you. I will follow you everywhere. I will go to the death. A little girl asks him, hey, aren't you one of Jesus' disciples? Nope, don't know him. Who's Jesus? I haven't even heard of him denies Jesus, right? The next morning, here's Jesus before these chief leaders of Israel, the scribes, the elders, the chief priests, and they began to accuse Jesus of blasphemy. And then since they had him in his custody, they began to mock him. They began to beat him, saying all kinds of evil against him, accusing him of all these things. And then once they had their fill of him, they decided we need to get him out of our hands and have somebody else do our dirty work. So the next morning, they send Jesus to Pilate. And Pilate is standing there before Jesus and asks Jesus the question, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus politely responds, you have said so. Think about the showdown. Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, I am king. To the Romans, this was blasphemy because you know who their king is? It's Caesar. Caesar's Lord, not this king of the Jews. So here we have a showdown that Mark has put before our very eyes. Caesar, the most powerful ruler in all the world, versus the king of the Jews. Pilate doesn't find fault with Jesus. He wants to release Jesus. So he goes to the people and says, okay, guys, who do you want? Do you want Barabbas, this murderer, this insurrectionist, this person that killed our own people? Do you want him to be released, or do you want the king of the Jews to be released? And who do the people choose? They choose Barabbas. Now, 
I was talking to a friend of mine. Remember I told you, you got to pay attention to the details of Mark because this one I blew past, and I didn't catch it. And I was talking to a friend of mine, and he goes, yeah, Barabbas' name means son of the father. And I went, yeah, Barabbas' name means... Wait a second, time out. Did you just say his name means son of the father? And he's like, yep. And all of a sudden, a light bulb went off in my mind. Here's a guilty murderer, Barabbas, trying to bring God's kingdom into the world through violence. Then you have the true son of the father, Jesus, the one who from the beginning of Mark's gospel, where God the father says, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Two sons of the father, one the true, one the murderer. And the murderer, the guilty one, is released to freedom. And the innocent one is dying in his place. Are you with me? This is the gospel that Mark is putting before our eyes. All of us can identify with Barabbas. You might say, I haven't murdered anybody, Brad. Yeah, but you've broken one of God's laws. And that brings condemnation. It brings death. It's sin. And yet Jesus, we're the guilty ones. Yet Jesus went to the cross as the innocent son of the Father so that we could be freed. Are you with me? You with me here? So, continuing on, okay? This is the gospel being played out before our very eyes. Six times throughout chapter 15, you can go back and you can count them yourself. Jesus is called the King of the Jews. Mark wants us to realize what's happening here. Jesus has been preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. God is, Jesus is bringing God's kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And Mark wants us to see this is the king. Jesus is becoming the king here because, look, he is being called king of the Jews over and over and over again. Then once Pilate realizes that the people want to crucify Jesus, he says, fine, here you go, Jesus. I'm sending you over to my soldiers. And the scriptures say that he sends Jesus over to a battalion of Roman soldiers. A battalion was about 600 soldiers. Now, sometimes when I used to read the scriptures, I thought, okay, maybe it was a few, a handful of soldiers that were mocking Jesus. 600! That is a lot of battle-hardened soldiers. And like battle-hardened soldiers who do with their enemies that are in captivity... Sometimes the worst comes out of you. And they take this person that they've always wanted to do to a king of the Jews. They dress him up with a purple robe, put a crown of thorns on his head, and then they say, we're going to do what we've always wanted to do to a king of the Jews, but we haven't been able to. We're going to beat him. It says they spit on him, pulled his beard, hit him with a centurion staff, They kneel down mockingly, you're the king of the Jews, you're the king of the Jews. And they completely humiliate and degrade Jesus. And then they drag him out to a place called Golgotha, which is called the place of the school. And this is the climactic moment that the writer Mark has been building us to. From the very first time that Jesus puts his head out to do his ministry, the enemy in darkness has been on his heels. Jesus goes into the wilderness to be tempted, and who meets him there? Satan. So all throughout Mark's gospel, you hear people, Jesus is of the devil. Jesus is a blasphemer. Everywhere Jesus goes, evil is behind him. And this is the moment where the evil is coming out to do its worst. The religious, the Jewish religious leaders, the Roman Empire, the people who had the greatest control to put people down, are now all coming upon Jesus, basically suffocating Jesus with this world of evil and darkness. And in the place known of death, Jesus is nailed to the cross, and Pilate puts his crime above his head, which reads what? The king of the Jews. And the scriptures say there were two thieves that were crucified on either side of them. But again, remember, we're paying attention to details. Thieves is not just mean people who stole a box of candy from the store. It doesn't mean somebody who just robbed a bank and now they're put on the cross because they stole. The word for thieves there, or bandits, literally means they were revolutionaries. 
There are people trying to bring God's kingdom into the world through violence. And these people that were trying to start a revolution, two revolutionaries on either side of Jesus, while you have the true revolutionary, Jesus Christ himself, who is dying an innocent death. And even then, with that picture, Mark is pointing out the gospel to us. Because one of those revolutionaries, Jesus looks at him and says, today you will be with me in where? Paradise. The murderer gets freedom while the innocent one dies on a cross. This is the the picture that Mark wants us to, to capture. And as Jesus hangs on this cross, the Jewish leaders down below begin to mock him. He can save others, but he can't save himself. Let the king of Israel come off the cross so that we may see it, and then we'll believe in him. Yet Jesus remains on that cross. Why? Because the the Savior, the Messiah, had to stay on the cross. And so we ask the question, why the cross? Look at verse 33 in Mark chapter 15. It says, And when the sixth hour had come, which is 12 o'clock p.m., There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, three o'clock p.m. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Mark points out that darkness fell upon this place of death. It wasn't a total eclipse of the heart, people. It's not a metaphor. It literally happened. But for Mark, it also, this is, this, this is an echo of the very first pages of Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and darkness hovered over the face of the deep. This is God doing a new thing in the world with Jesus on the cross. New creation is about to happen. This is what God is doing. This is why he did something that the whole world had to take notice. Darkness at 3 p.m., that's not normal. I've never walked outside at 3 o'clock and saw darkness. If I did, I would be afraid and run into my basement, which I don't have. But this is something entirely new that doesn't happen. But here's the sad part. Many missed it and didn't recognize that this is the moment where God had returned to usher his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. And many people couldn't recognize it and see it. Then you see Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In one sense... Jesus cries this out because every sin that I committed, that you committed, that the whole entire world committed, Jesus was bearing all of it. Every crime, all the guilt, all of our shame, all of our regrets, all of that wicked things that we have done in our life, Jesus was bearing. And not only that, but this was the moment where God turned his back on Jesus. The one that you see in scriptures, my Father who art in heaven, Abba has turned his back and has forsaken the Son. He heard those words that he was his beloved Son, God was pleased with him, and in this moment, on the cross, God was nowhere to be found, and Jesus was in anguish. The sin of the world bearing on the weight of his shoulders. But in another sense, Mark has this in mind. You see, any time, I'm going to give you a little tip here. This is what I had to learn myself when studying Scripture. When a New Testament writer quotes the Old Testament, 
He wants you to not just remember that one quote. A lot of times we look at that quote and go, oh, that's a cool quote. That's from Psalms. Awesome. Cool. He doesn't want you just to remember that quote as something cool to remember. He's stating that quote because he wants to remind you of the entire passage where that quote is from. So what I started doing is I don't just look at that quote. I go to the entire, I go to where it says, Psalm 22. Open up Psalm 22. And I read the entire chapter. Why? Because this is what the New Testament writers, they, they, want, they expect us to know these stories. And so we have to go back, and when we read Psalm 22, we will find the answer to the question, why the cross? I'll give it to you here. Psalm 22 speaks of a servant of Israel who will come. And when this servant of Israel comes, and truly lives out the purpose and the vocation of Israel, the world will never be the same. A revolution begins where everything changes. But you see, Israel itself, the people of Israel, were chosen by God to bring the promises of God into the world, and they were to bring salvation not just to the Jewish people, but to the entire world. Israel was called to be a light to the nations. But Israel had a problem. You see, Israel was supposed to be this beautiful light. And to shine in the world, showing the world what God's love looks like. Showing the nations, here, God has loved me so that I could love my neighbor. But Israel, the people that were supposed to be the rescue for the world, were the problem of the world. Because they gave in to sin. They gave in to their idols. And when they begin to give in to their idols, no matter what those idols are, it could have been Addiction, it could have been a real false god that many times you see in Scripture. They're worshiping these false gods. And so many times they had these idols that would come in. And here's what happens with idols in their life. It took their light. And it begins to suffocate their light. And instead of them being the light, they're trapped. You with me? Sorry, give me a second here. I love playing with blocks, especially at church. So, I can't really do it on the top. But here we go. These idols get in their way. They're trapped within their idolatry. And it's the same with us, guys. Scripture is safe for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? Our idolatry keeps us trapped and keeps us stuck where we aren't able to really fulfill our purpose as human beings. We're supposed to bear God's image. We're supposed to love people. We're supposed to go around. But our idols cause us to do nothing but think about ourselves. And it might be addiction. It might be lust. It might be greed. It might be the pursuit of my career above all things. It might be sacrificing everything for me and my family suffers behind. Those are all idols. And this is what Israel wrestled with. This is what we wrestled with. And Israel, who was supposed to be this servant to the world, failed over and over and over and over again because of their idolatry. And they were stuck and they were trapped. But yet, out of the love of God, the grace of God, and the faithfulness of God to his promises, he said a true servant, a suffering servant, would come and he would be the true light to the world. But he would have to suffer to become the light of the world. And here's what I would like to show you. Look at me at verse 1 in Psalm 22. It'll be up there on the screen for you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you, our fathers, trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me, They wag their heads. See if this sounds familiar. He trusts in the Lord. 
Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Where do we see this happening? Jesus on the cross. We just heard it. Jesus, you can save others. Why don't you save yourself? He was despised and rejected even by his own people. Look at what goes on. It says, many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Why is a suffering servant's bones out of joint? Because he's hanging on a cross. And they say hanging on a cross takes your shoulders and pops them out of the sockets. You see, why the cross? Because this is what the suffering servant God had planned for him to go through. That for him to achieve something on the cross, the suffering servant must go to the cross. Because that was God's will. It was his plan for Jesus to do that. And it goes on and says, my heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a pot's herd, and my, my tongue sticks to my jaws. Remember, some of the other writers give this detail where Jesus is on the cross, and he cries out, I thirst. Why the cross? Because this is what Jesus was supposed to do. He died in accordance with the scriptures. And here is a crucifixion story being played out. The verse continues, you lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have what? Pierced my hands and feet. Crucifixion was not pulled out of thin air. It wasn't something the Romans thought, this is how we're going to kill the Messiah. That's what they thought. But God said this was the plan all along for my servant king. He would change the world through his suffering death on a cross. Look at verse 17. I can count all my bones. And not a bone of Jesus was broken throughout the whole process. You see, Jesus died in accordance with the scripture. Why the cross? Because it was the fulfillment of of God's plan all along to bring his plan of rescue, not just to Israel, but to the entire world. And look at this part, the last verse. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. And in the crucifixion story, the Roman guards at the foot of the cross cast lots for the clothes that he had. So why the cross? Because it was God's will. Another passage in the Old Testament says it was the will of God to crush him. This was God's plan all along. This is how Jesus ushered in God's kingdom. This is how the moment where darkness was pushed back, where the true light has shone in the world, and his kingdom would reign on the earth as in heaven. And it would reach the entire world. Then look at verse 27. Towards the end of the psalm, look at how it ends. Because he wants us to keep both of these in mind. The servant is suffering, but here's why. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For what? For what? What does that word say? Kingship belongs to to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who will go down to the dust, even the one who cannot keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him, and it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. Generation after generation from the moment of Jesus' crucifixion, generations have been told that there was a man who died on a cross. His name is Jesus, and his death changed everything. We're standing here today because of this promise that God gave in Psalm 22. 
that when this suffering servant dies, God's kingdom will come on earth as in heaven. He will reign, and generation after generation are going to proclaim, and we will say, Jesus has done it. Amen? So the answer, why the cross? The cross was necessary for the suffering servant to become king. Now for the second question, what did the cross actually accomplish? And here's what I put in my notes. I put it this way to sum up the passage. The servant king has set us free. The servant king has set us free. And in Mark 15, 37, it says this, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Here we have the moment of Jesus' death. The Jewish religious leaders, they're ecstatic. This person who annoyed him, them, who called them out for their hypocrisy, he's dead. Good riddance. Now we can continue on in our legalism, which brings so much happiness to everybody's lives. Then you had the Roman Empire. Here's another revolutionary claiming to be king of the world and saying Caesar's not. Well, guess what? This annoying person is dead as well. And just like every other revolutionary who's come up, we killed them, and once the leader dies, their followers, they fizzle out, and we never have to worry about that person ever again. This is the moment where Rome was like, There goes another person. It's all over. Then you have Jesus' disciples who in this moment, their whole world came crashing down. All the miracles they witnessed, all the beautiful things they saw Jesus do to love people, no matter where they've been or what they've done or who they are, in this moment came to an end. They're discouraged. They're disappointed. They're disillusioned. And just like Jesus prophesied, when the shepherd struck, the sheep are going to scatter. And that's what happened to the disciples. They're in their rooms wondering, what just happened? Was all this for nothing? Was all of this just kind of some big lie that this guy had? And in the moment, there's this moment where it looks like everything has ended. Jesus is dead. Now it's done. What actually happened at the moment of Jesus' death? Well, there's a, a few things that happened. The first is this, the temple veil in the temple that separated the Holy of Holies, meaning God's space would be behind the veil. If you wanted to, God's, God's presence would fill the temple, but only in this space. And it was divided by this veil, and only a priest could enter into there. That veil that separated God's space from man's space was ripped in two from top to bottom. Why? Because now God's space has invaded our space. And everybody has the opportunity to access the Father through faith in Jesus Christ. Anywhere, anytime, no matter who you are, you can have access to the Father's love through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself is the true temple. This one temple made by man is not necessary. Jesus has become the true temple, and faith in him gives you access to your heavenly Father. Second thing that happened in here, we have to remember that Jesus chose the Passover. During the Passover time, the Jewish people would use this as a time where they would remember that God set them free from their oppressor, the Egyptians. God had rescued them from this oppression, delivered them to freedom to be God's people and to live in his land where he would be their God and they would be his people. Jesus chose this intentionally because he is the perfect sacrificial lamb who died on this cross so that he could deliver people the moment they placed their faith in him. He is the true Passover. This is a new exodus that is happening. This isn't going to be something you got to go to the temple every year and do. No, faith in Christ gives you forgiveness of sins for all time. 
and immediately at Jesus' death, this is what it means as well. Remember, all of us are trapped in our idols. And in the moment where it looked like Jesus was defeated, this is what Jesus did to all of the idols that entrap all of us. And the light can shine again. Every power that has control over us was defeated the moment at Jesus' death. You might say, Brett, how, how, do you, how do you know that? Remember, Jesus died in accordance with what? Thank you. You guys are so smart. Colossians 2, verse 13, written by the Apostle Paul, says this, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Catch this. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So a couple notes here. Rulers and authorities, yes, it meant the Jewish leaders. Yes, it meant the Roman empires. But Jesus came to defeat our true enemy, which is our idolatry. All of our sins come because we have an idol in our life. Some people say, no, you're a sinner because you lust after another woman who's not your wife. No, that's idolatry. Idolatry is lust, and you're a slave to it. And you don't do anything but what that master wants you to do. And that's what describes all of us. Every idol is us doing what our slave master wants us to do. And here it says, Paul says, Jesus took those idols and crushed them, triumphed over them, and put them to open shame. Here's what, I would quote, look, here's what I would want you to catch to. The English translation for that very last word in verse 15 ends with him. But in my study Bible, I have this little number that's right to the side of him. And I look down, and there's a little footnote at the bottom. And in parentheses, it says, that is the cross. So take out him, and we can read it this way. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in that is the cross. That's where the powers and rulers were defeated. And, here, and catch this. Everybody else in the entire world thought Jesus is dead. But his death was literally his victory. And the Apostle Paul says this another way. In another passage, he says it like this. Of the, none of the rulers of, the, of this age understood this. For if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They wouldn't have done that. What they thought was their idea in victory, they were okie-doked because it brought Jesus' victory. And because of that, here's what happens to all of us who put our faith in him. Our idols are broken. Whatever your greatest idol has been, is, that power has been broken. But the enemy wants you to think that thing controls you. The enemy wants you to think that that has ultimate power over you. And we have to remember what scripture says. Their power was broken on the cross. We don't have to walk around defeated. We don't have to figure out how can I get this. You don't have to get the idol out. Jesus will break that idol in your life by placing your faith in him. And when we do, not only are our idols broken, but we get forgiveness of sins. Think of your biggest mistake, your biggest sin. And Paul said he took that and nailed it to the cross. The legal debt that each of us owed for all of our sins, it was canceled on the cross of Jesus Christ. We're the innocent one bore that weight, bore our condemnation, and in return, he says, you will have forgiveness of sins. And your original purpose will be restored, and you will be a light to the nations, a light to the world, 
and you can truly become the people of God that I created you to be, to bear my image, to love as I've loved, to offer forgiveness as I've offered forgiveness, to give grace as I've given grace, to give mercy as I've given mercy, so that you can love me with all your heart, soul, and mind, and you can love your neighbor as yourself. This is what God can restore to us and make us right with him through faith in Jesus Christ. And then we'll end this section with this. When we get to the end of this crucifixion scene in verse 39, the Roman guard at the foot of the cross proclaims, truly this man was the son of God. And Mark puts this there intentionally for us to see the irony. All throughout the beginning of Mark's gospel, people are saying all kinds of things about Jesus, right? He's possessed by a demon. He's crazy. He's a blasphemer. His disciples, how many times did Jesus have to tell them, do you not understand? Do you still not understand who I am? Peter, who do you say I am? You're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And then Peter goes and denies him. And the one person who gets it is a battle-hardened Roman soldier, a Gentile, not even the Jewish person, a Gentile proclaims, truly this man was the Son of God, God's beloved Son with whom he is well pleased. The Gentile gets it. Why does Mark include this? Because he wants us to catch that the servant has become king and is the true light of the world because already the light has gone to the nations by this Roman soldier proclaiming, truly this was the Son of God. This is the gospel that we see. And when we look at this story, we see the full love of God on display. Do we not? He didn't have to do this for any of us. Why did he do this? Because God loves us. God loves me. God loves you. And here's the best part about it all. God loves you despite your sin. So many times we've given the bad view of God where we just make God out. He's out to get you because of your sins, right? I'm going to point out everything wrong in you and you need to change before you burn. And that was the message we used. It's like, ah, what, what, ah, you're scaring me. But the love of God is this, is that you were condemned to death. Yet I will give my life as a ransom for many. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. This is God's love on display for you. Doesn't matter where you've been. Doesn't matter what you've done. Doesn't matter who you are. His salvation is offered to everyone. And it's will you put your faith in him? Will you say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner? And so today I leave you with two application points. Actually, before that, I want to read to you a passage from Isaiah 53. It's a couple short verses. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is our servant king. This is our God. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, I would encourage today do that. He wants to show you that he is your father. He wants to love you as a true father, a father that will never let you down, a father that will never fail you. And secondly, here's the application. Jesus shows each of us as his followers how to rule in his kingdom, and that kingdom includes suffering. And it's not just I'm suffering because I'm having issues in my marriage. That's a different kind of suffering. The suffering that Jesus is saying we're going to rule with is the suffering where we're going to be persecuted for our faith. It doesn't mean that once I give my life to Christ, then all of a sudden everybody's going to love me and love my message. You're going to find out that people love their idols more than they love the message of hope. And so you will be persecuted. You will be mocked. You will be made fun of. I've lost friendships 
because of the gospel. I don't do the things that these people do, and so no long, I don't get invited anymore. Brad's not like us. Brad's different, and you lose friendships. People have lost families. People are disowned for putting their faith in Jesus Christ. For some people, putting their faith in Christ comes with huge consequences. But this is how Jesus ruled. His rule wasn't with violence, wasn't with guns. He didn't bring it about like that. It was through his suffering. And he shows us that his people, we must rule through the same thing. We usher God's kingdom into the world by loving God and loving others. There's no other way. It's through suffering that we rule because Christ was the example. Jesus Christ did not come to be served, but to serve. And so today, the challenge is this. Either put your faith in Christ and understand at some point, you are going to be persecuted for your faith, but count it all joy to recognize that Jesus suffered in the same way, will suffer in the same way, but this is how God's kingdom people rule. The servant king has truly set us free. If you would, bow your hearts with me this morning. Father God, we are so thankful that you are the faithful one. Father, we thank you that you did not give up on your people. Father, you know how quickly and easily it is for us to fall into our idols and our idolatry. So quick we are to turn from you, to shake our fist at you and say our way is better. And Father, we thank you for your beloved son, Jesus Christ, who said, I will choose to lay down my life so that these people who are condemned to death will experience freedom, hope, joy, and healing. Father, I pray for those who have never put their faith in you, that today would be the day that they make the declaration, just like that Roman soldier, truly, this man is the Son of God. And they would have access to their Heavenly Father, where they can cry out, Abba, Abba, Daddy. Father, I pray for each of us, that we would recognize that our way of ushering your kingdom into this dark world, Father God, is through suffering. To do it your way, Father God. To love you with all of our hearts and to love our neighbor as herself. Do a work that only you can do. And it's in your powerful name we pray. Amen.